All right, good evening. It is good to be back with you again. Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, that's the whole chapter. We have been using Sunday evenings this year to go through the whole book of Revelation. Uh, we'll, by the time we get to Christmas, we'll be done with it, and we can't give up tonight. Uh, and so we're going to talk about this chapter. One of the things uh, that I have been uh, saying to you, uh, as I remind you just of the structure of the book as we go through it, is that the, the outline for the book is four sets of seven. There's seven letters, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And if you know those four sets of seven, then you'll know where you are in the book. We are through the four, uh, the seven letters, we're through the seven seals, we're through the seven trumpets, and we've been in a transition in the book that exists between uh, the trumpets and the bowls, and we come to the end of that transition uh, as we get to Revelation chapter 15, and as we move forward into the book, we're going to see the conclusion of the book with the seven bowls and the entrance of humanity into uh, eternity. But tonight we're still in this transition as we move towards the bowls of God's wrath, and this is what God says. Then I saw another son in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had been victorious over the beast in his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works. O Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to ask you that you would watch over us. We have so many things to do tonight. We need to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We need to answer questions that your people have about your church. We need to talk about your truth and be encouraged about the return of your son. And so, Father, I pray that you would have your hand on this time together, your hand on this time, and that you would make us more like Jesus because we are together. Father, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I think about my life and the times in which I have lived, it, it seems to me that I am living on the seam of history. Uh, when I was a little boy, my family hardly ever went to church. We went a few times, but uh, we didn't go very often. And that was a conversation piece in my town growing up. That was a conversation piece with our friends. It, it struck people as odd that we didn't go. We were definitely in the minority of people that never went to church anywhere. And now in my adult life, it seems to me that the odd ones are the people who go to church. There certainly isn't the sort of cultural pressure that we had in the last century that you just need to be at church. And if you're a good Christian, you'll be at church. And if you're a good American, you'll be at church. Uh, and, and what that means is that there's a sense in which that pressure being off is good. We're, we're separating the wheat from the chaff. We're finding out who is really loving and trusting Jesus and who just went to church because it made them look better in their community. But one of the things that is 
tough about it is I find that we constantly as Christians alive in these days need to be making arguments for why you need to come to church. There are a lot of reasons not to. There are a lot of sort of very secular and unspiritual reasons. Pajamas and donuts in your kitchen on Sundays is a more relaxing morning than uh, getting dressed up and driving to that place down the street. There are spiritual reasons not to do it. Well, I can listen to good preaching on a podcast. I, like right here, I can listen to any preacher I want. And so why go get sick and, or go mask up or go have to get a vaccine just to go hobnob with a bunch of people when, can I, when I can listen to the best teaching in the world right on my phone? There are a lot of reasons that sound good, and there are a lot of reasons that don't sound so good as to why we might not go to church. But the, but the point is, I'm finding that we have to make a lot of arguments about being committed to our church, arguments that you didn't have to make 20, 10, maybe even five years ago. I think that Revelation 15 in so many ways, is about an argument for why you need to be committed to this body of believers. An argument for why eternity is at stake, and whether you get out of the bed, or get up off of the couch, or quit, what you're, quit the yard work, and come to be a part of this church. I think this text gives us five eternal reasons why we need to have a growing commitment to the church of Jesus Christ. And here's the first one. We are in an ultimate struggle. We're in an ultimate struggle. I saw another sign in heaven, verse 1 says, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. One of the things that we've seen in the judgments in the book of Revelation is that they are judgments from God against a world that will not believe in Him and that insists on resisting His will. This is an ultimate struggle. It is the human race against the Creator God. It is the ultimate struggle of which we are all a part. It's way more important than your life savings. It's way more important than whatever conflict you have going on in your family. This is a conflict that defines everything about who you are and everything about who we are for the rest of eternity. And there is one place that you can go to get reminded that this is the way it is. And it's this church. It is the church of Jesus Christ. You can't go to a political rally You can't go to a family reunion. You can't go to a restaurant and be reminded of ultimate things. It's only at church where you can come together and fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ and sing songs and listen listen to preaching about the ultimate struggle that defines all of our lives and will define all of our eternities. There's a second reason. We're in an ultimate struggle that will end. This ultimate struggle doesn't go on forever. It ends. Verse 1 says again, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. When we get to the bowls of God's wrath, we get to the very last judgments before the return of Christ. The text itself says, this is the last. This is the end. This struggle will not go on forever, but it will end. And what we do now defines how it will end for us. The relationship between the seven letters, Jesus' communication to his global church, and the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls, God's judgment poured out on a sinful and rebellious world. The relationship between the judgments and the letters is to the extent that you experience suffering in the last days as Christ's church, it's testing for you. Jesus Christ is testing your mettle. Do you love Jesus because of what Jesus gives you or do you love Jesus when the chips are down? 
and how you behave here at this church and whether it matters to you determines how you fit in to this ultimate struggle that will end. Jesus Christ in Luke 18, 8 says, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? What will He find you doing when He comes back? Will you be a vibrant part of a local community that knows heaven and earth is the only thing that matters? Or will you be in your jammies with a jelly donut? Third, we're in an ultimate struggle over God's reputation. (laughs) How you come off looking in this is not the most important reality because you are not the most important reality. The most important reality and the most important being in the universe is God Himself, and all of this is testimony to Him and His reputation. Verse 3 says, they sang, the heavenly host sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations." These are the redeemed host in heaven who are singing praises about the character of God. These are people who are shouting the faithfulness of God throughout the ages. That's what this life is about. And we dare not, as the people of God this side of heaven, blaspheme the character of God by not spending our time and our energies on the church of God. We're making a statement to the nations and to our families and to our communities. Don't think they don't notice you getting into your car and leaving way too early on Sunday. Don't think you don't notice they don't notice you coming back way too late on Sunday afternoon and then leaving again way too early on Sunday afternoon. They notice, they pay attention to what you're doing, and this is not about you. This is about a, a reputation for God's name in our community. Fourth reason why you need to have an increasing commitment to your local church is we're in a struggle where the nations are at stake. The whole world is at stake in this ultimate struggle that will end. Verse 4 says, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed." What we are doing in our worship and our outreach and our discipleship is we are shining a bright light to the nations. We want people in heaven all across the world because of our faithfulness today. We are a church that while we want to reach all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life, we're committed to the nations as well. We fund individual missionaries, and above and beyond that, we invest hundreds of thousands of dollars every year into international missions through the cooperative program because we are committed that not just all of Jacksonville would know Jesus, but the whole world would know Jesus. And we can't do this global work without you. And you shouldn't want to be living your life disconnected from this global work where the nations are at stake in this ultimate struggle. Here's the fifth reason you need to increase, increase your church commitment in these days. It's we're in an ultimate struggle that we will win. We're in an ultimate struggle that we will win. If you turn on cable, they're not going to tell you that everything is all right. If you're sweating with your across-the-street neighbor about what's going on out there, they're not going to tell you that it's all going to be all right. You have to come to church to be reminded that Jesus Christ is the King of kings, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ can defeat every enemy, and Jesus Christ will defeat every enemy. In fact, when you understand what's going on, Jesus Christ has already defeated every enemy. We are just awaiting the victory celebration. We win this thing. That's what Revelation is about, and that's what Revelation 15 is about. Not everybody wins. Verses 7 to 8 says, One of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke 
from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Not everybody wins, some people get wrath. The people who get wrath are the people who do not trust in Jesus Christ, and the people who win are the people who have turned from their sins and trusted in Jesus Christ in his life and his death and in his resurrection. This is what verse 2 says, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. We saw the sea of glass in Revelation chapter 4, if you remember that, and that was a symbol of the peace and the tranquility of heaven. It was a symbol of Christ's victory over the world of wickedness, and now the crystal sea is back, but flames are coming up out of it. I think the point of that is the suffering that Christians need to go through to get to that point. But whatever suffering we have to go through, we get to the sea, we get to the throne, we get to Christ, and we know victory. We know victory that the objects of God's wrath does not know. The object of God's wrath does not know God's eternal peace. The reason we want all of Jacksonville to know all of Jesus for all of life is because without Jesus, Jacksonville will know wrath. Jacksonville will know wrath and bitterness and horror forever because a horrible day of judgment is coming. But that day isn't today. We're still here. We're still here. And as long as we are still here giving witness to who Jesus is, there is still hope. Today is not the day of wrath. Today is the day of mercy. Today is the day that anyone who would call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what that means is that when you're saved, you know victory forever and ever and ever. You can't go anywhere else and hear about this. You have to be a member of the people of God to remember these ultimate things. And I want to talk about this tonight because here in just a moment, I'm going to give you an update on some things that are going on in our church. And what I don't want is for you to go, okay, there's a building update, and okay, there's a staffing update, and okay, there's a scheduling update, and get lost in the details. These are the means to the end. This is what we are doing to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what we're doing to reach all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. If you're here tonight, you've never repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ. We're not going to have a time of response right now. Uh, we'll have a, an opportunity for that after uh, the service. Uh, but you can reach out to us. You can reach out to us at fbcjacks.com. You can reach out to us at askapastor at fbcjacks.com. Uh, and we want to hear from you if you want to lay hold of the faith once for all delivered to the saints that comes in Christ and in Christ alone.